Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy Chen, and I'm the Managing Director of StorageX. And we have a fantastic uh, symposium for you today uh, around a very important topic, thermal runaway in batteries, uh, with a fantastic duo giving you a perspective from both the industry and also from some of the latest modeling uh, developments that we now have available to tackle such complex, complex phenomena like a thermal runway in batteries. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Troy Hayes. Uh, Dr. Troy Hayes uh, is a practice director of Asia offices and principal engineer at Exponent. Dr. Hayes has extensive experience solving complex technical problems in a variety of industries, including consumer electronics, consumer products, medical devices, vehicles, industrial equipment and technology product and development. He has conducted technology due diligence reviews of emerging technologies and intellectual property for clients, such as investment firms, IP owners, and companies interested in purchasing IP or its associated products. He specializes in the mechanical behavior, degradation, and failure of materials, including metal, polymer, ceramic, and glasses. Dr. Hayes has worked extensively on projects involving battery design, manufacturing, and failure analysis. So with that, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Hayes. Thank you, Jimmy. And good morning, everyone. So as Jimmy said, we're gonna be talking about thermal runaway in lithium ion batteries. Um, and my part of the talk, we're gonna go through some analyses and case studies related to that and how it impacts the design uh, and things that uh, integrators have to think about when they're designing products that use lithium ion batteries. Um, so as Jimmy said, um, I'm the Prax Director of Materials and Corrosion Engineering at Exponent. I'm also director of our Asia offices. I've been an exponent for almost 19 years. Uh, my background is in mechanical engineering and material science. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Nick Fianza, who helped uh, a lot putting together these slides. Probably couldn't have you know, got them prepared in time without him. So thank you, Nick. So Exponent is an engineering consulting company started back in 1967 out of a group of professors uh, here at Stanford, um, like many, many startup companies, especially in the Bay Area. Um, we have over 950 consulting staff around the world at this point in nine, over 90 technical disciplines. So basically any technical discipline you can imagine. Um, we started as the brainchild for uh, Dr. Alan Tettleman, um, who is uh, many of you, if you're in material science, may recognize the textbook here on the screen, Barrett, Nixon, Tettleman, uh, three very esteemed professors. So as I said, about every technical discipline you can imagine, all the engineering sciences, uh, human sciences, human factors, uh, all, all different aspects um, of uh, any technical problem you can imagine. When we're talking about batteries, the groups that we have that specialize in these areas. We have over 80 consultants who spend most of their time working on uh, primarily lithium ion battery uh, projects. And of course, that would include vehicle engineering with the proliferation of electric vehicles, uh, thermal sciences to study the, the, the heat transfer issues and, the, and how fires spread. Uh, polymer science material chemistry, looking at the molecular level, how batteries operate and, and degradation mechanisms. Mechanical engineering to evaluate how those systems are put together and behave in use. Um, as I said, I'm in the materials and corrosion engineering practice. So looking at all the material aspects of batteries and manufacturing. And of course, electrical engineering, computer science, how all these systems are integrated and how you're uh, treating the battery uh, on charging, discharging, things like that. And of course, data sciences was a huge part, uh, especially as you're getting larger and larger batteries you're getting more and more data from the field that needs to be processed and analyzed. So here at Exponent, we have, with this multidisciplinary approach, we're able to evaluate any type of battery issue that, that could be out there, ranging in scale and complexity from implantable medical devices, to consumer electronics, uh, electric vehicles, and as we're going up in scale, uh, also the largest systems on earth uh, with utility grade uh, storage systems. We have about 25 offices around the US, several in Europe, and three in Asia, and by the little batteries you can see around, those are the offices where we have people who specialize in batteries, so we really have global coverage. What I'll be talking about first is looking at uh, what thermal runaway is, uh, what that looks like in, in, uh, in practice, and then kind of consider how that influences designers and integrators when you have to think about those things when you're putting a battery pack together. There are three main form factors of a battery cell. The difference between a battery cell and a battery 
battery cells, the individual unit that holding the electrical chemical energy and a battery is that those battery cells combined with an enclosure and protection electronics, things like that. So the three major form factors are cylindrical, where you have a, a wound electrode that's put into a cylindrical can. Uh, in this case, the negative is attached to the can. Uh, so the, the very top is positive and the whole can is negative. You have prismatic, which is long chocolate bar form factor cell. In this case, mostly it's a hard aluminum can that is connected to the positive, and then the negative has a feed through uh, on one side. And then you have what are called pouch cells, and that you have literally like a vacuum seal aluminum bag has polypropylene on the inside, nylon on the outside, and then you seal that around a stacked or wound cell. Um, in this case, the pouch is floating, so it's not connected to the positive or the negative. And so each of these form factors have different considerations, but there's a lot of commonalities as you go through when you're trying to, to understand those. So what is Therm Runaway? Well, first I can kind of show you what it looks like. Inside the cell and the rate of heat generation during those chemical reactions exceeds the ability to draw heat away from those cells, away from that, uh, that reaction. And so then you get a self-propagating thermal runaway reaction. And so mechanistically, inside of a lithium ion battery, the main components are starting from the bottom to the top. You have the cathode or positive electrode, which is a, a metal oxide painted on uh, aluminum foil usually. Um, then the next in the stack, you have uh, the separator, which is a polymeric uh, porous membrane. It allows lithium ions to transfer back and forth through that in the medium of the electrolyte, um, which is uh, between and around all of these components. And then on the top of this image, you have the negative electrode or the anode, which is typically a graphite type material painted onto a copper foil. Um, now, when you start to have therm runaway, uh, or the, just before you have therm runaway, you'll have breakdown of the protective layer on the surface of a negative electrode, known as the solid, solid electrolyte interface. And that's a protective layer that's formed during the formation process during battery manufacturing. Um, that's the first thing to break down and start to have some exothermal reactions. But you, when you get a little higher temperature and you haven't kind of stopped anything from, uh, from propagating, then you'll start to get uh, major reactions happening where you have oxidation and heat generation um, at your cathode. Um, that will interact with the electrolyte and you get to the point where you start boiling the electrolyte, you get massive gas generation, and that will then cause venting as you saw in the video. Uh, and once, once you vent, there's a high likelihood you'll have ignition because you have organic uh, solvents that combines with the air uh, once it escapes the, the cell and you get the uh, flaming combustion. So in uh, you, one way to characterize this, you can use an accelerator rate calorimeter, um, which is where you have a large adiabatic chamber you put the cell inside and you slowly heat that chamber up, uh, like five degree increments, for example. Um, this jagged line, this sawtooth is the chamber temperature, the sidewall. Um, and you just wait. Uh, you hold at that new temperature and see if you get anything happening at the cell. And so you can very slowly go up until you start to see some exothermic reactions. Um, and then once you get to 160, 180 degrees, uh, this first exotherm is probably associated with the, the anode. Uh, but then once you start to get the cathode going off, you get this vertical uh, line where you just get a rapid increase in temperature. You saw the nail penetration test that just happened very quickly. Uh, your voltage, which is the green line, do drops off as you start to get shorts within the cell. Um, and the temperature, this is the external cell temperature, it gets above 400 degrees C. Um, and that's, that's what happens. So what happens inside the cell? Well, the temperature outside gets to, like I said, it could be as high as 400 or a little higher degrees centigrade. Inside the cell, it gets much hotter. So typically it, it gets to about six or 800 degrees C inside the cell. Well, if you look at the, the two metals that are inside, the aluminum that's for the positive uh, electrode and the copper for the negative current collector, um, what I have here is a, a part of the phase diagram. So we have 0% copper on the left up to 60%. The melting temperature of copper is about 1,085 degrees centigrade. So when therm runaway happens, you get to six or 800 degrees, it's not going to melt copper. But it will melt aluminum, which melts at 660 degrees C. Well, there's two different ways you can actually get melting of the copper in the cell. One is as soon as you melt the aluminum, it starts floating throughout the cell, it will alloy with the copper, and then you can get a eutectic uh, alloy that can melt as low as 548 degrees C. And so you get a lot of melting of the copper when it alloys. In addition, if you have a short circuit where you have I square R heating from a short between the positive and negative electrode, which can happen during the thermal runaway process, 
you can get in excess of this uh, type of temperature. Looking at those when you open up, they look substantially different. The alloying reaction, you can actually see blobs of aluminum sitting on the copper, um, and you'll see holes, like almost cookie cutter style holes, where those have fallen away. If you look on an SEM in backscattered mode, you'll see often a halo, but where you have a lower density alloy around these holes. Alum the, where you have the melting of the copper, on the other hand, you have these beaded edges where you have the, the metal wants to minimize surface energy, so it'll, it'll beat up around those edges, and that's what it looks like with pure melted copper. So what do cells look like after thermal runaway? Well, it really depends on a few different things. And in these slides, we're going to look at two different aspects here. One is state of charge, and one is the, the uh, age of the cell. And so here, this is a test we did on some cells from 2013. Uh, here at 50% state of charge, it looks almost like a brand new cell. You can't see much. You see some winding movement to the right. At 100%, you can see a lot of damage, but no obvious bright spots that you would expect in, um, in melting, um, which is what they look bright in a CT scan. Now, if you overcharge the cell, and that's where you can uh, start to get lithium plating in the cell, then you'll start to see more melting because lithium burns very, very hot and you can melt the copper. So you'll see a lot more bright spots. Okay, so this is what a cell from 2013 might look like. Uh, in thermal runaway at different states of charge. If you unroll the cell at 100% state of charge, you find no melting whatsoever. There's some alloying spots, as similar to what we talked about before, but no copper melting. So there was no uh, direct short circuit between electrodes that had a high enough current density to, to melt copper. Compared to the overcharge, overcharge, you see a lot of melting where you had lithium plating, you had, had shorts with much higher energy. Okay, so if you knew you had a cell that was uh, 2013 time frame, and you you were evaluating something forensically after a fire, you might be able to make some determinations about the state of charge. But compare that to 2018 and newer cells where you're going to higher voltage, higher energy densities. Here's a cell that we forced in the thermal runaway at 100% state of charge, and you see a lot of melting throughout that cell. Drop it to 60%, and then you start to see damage and some uh, alloying, but but no melting. So Equivalently, the 60% state of charge in some newer cells looks very similar to the 100% state of charge in the 2013 type cells. If we open those up, indeed, uh, when you look at 100% state of charge, you'll see the, the massive copper melting as you saw in the overcharge case in 2013. So it's important to understand you're getting more and more energetic failures uh, with newer and newer cells. Also depends on the actual history, usage history of the cell and, and what, what it's seen in the field. So what are the other considerations and why is state of charge SOC so important? Well, obviously the state of charge has to do with whether it's a discharge cell or a charged cell. So naturally, if you have a fully charged cell, you put more energy in, you're gonna get more energy out. And, and that's true, but it's not just uh, that simple. So if you look at this plot, there's three different lines. So the one interesting fact is on the bottom, you have mass loss, which is on the, the right axis here. And you can see whether it's 0% or 100% state of charge, the mass loss really didn't change. Now, that's only true in this case, uh, it's a, a study that was on pouch cells. So in pouch cells, remember you had that vacuum seal bag, it has uh, nylon on the outside, polypropylene on the inside. Those seals are made by literally melting the polypropylene on those three seams together when you close that vacuum bag. Well, when you go to thermal runaway on that type of cell, you don't get a very concentrated vent because all of that polypropylene will melt very easily. And so you get a diffuse vent around the three, at least three sides of the cell. As a result, you don't get a very strong jet of venting gas. And so you don't get a lot of mass difference with state of charge. They would look much different with a prismatic or a cylindrical cell where you have a, a directed vent. Um, but um, another interesting thing, if you look at the, um, total heat release, which is uh, this turquoise curve, you do see a, a, a difference between 0%, 100%. It's not that much. You may be about 40 watt hours at 0%, maybe 60 at 100%. So it's a difference about 50%. But what really makes a difference, in, and you see this dramatically on the blue line, which is the left axis, is the heat release rate, how quickly the energy comes out. So at 0%, the amount of heat generation is very low and then it's very fast when you have 100% state of charge. And so this has a lot of implications for propagation and whether that will actually be something you can suck the heat out and, and try to stop through heat sink or, or different mitigation measures. So of course, when you have thermal runaway, the cell that failed will of course be totally dead um, and uh, it risks igniting uh, flammables around if it's an individual cell or, or something you have, you could, you could possibly start a fire. 
And then, of course, the bigger risk as you're getting to larger multi-cell devices is that that becomes a propagating uh, event where you start to cause more and more cells to get off, go off. And as we'll see in a little bit, that can happen um, and gets very energetic. So how a cell actually goes to therm runaway, um, it really depends on the chemistry, whether you're using uh, some of the higher energy density chemistries um, or, or you know, LFP is considered safer. You have NMC and various different uh, uh, metal oxides that are used in the cathode. Uh, depends on the cell design, uh, whether it's a prismatic, a pouch, or uh, a cylindrical. And as we just talked about the state of charge, also depends on the initiation mechanism, whether it, the thermal runaway happens from an internal short, an external short, uh, from external heat attack. Um, so all those things will affect the behavior during thermal runaway. One thing that's really important to take home from, from this lecture, if nothing else, is thermal runaway is really stochastic. So even if you have nominally the same exact setup, and, and you do the same test one, two, three times, you might get three different results. So it's really important when you're thinking about, you know, if I'm gonna do a 9540A or some UL test on a huge system um, I, and it doesn't have a catastrophic failure, I mean, you can't just pat yourself on the back because if you do two or three tests, you might see very different results. And we're gonna talk about why some of those things are. So when you take these individual cells and put them into a battery pack, obviously one of the goals is to get the highest energy density possible. And if you have cylindrical cells, the highest densing, uh, density you can get is through a closed pack type uh, morphology. So you can put all these cylindrical cells in a closed pack arrangement and put them in a large uh, pack, weld all of them together. But you're kind of conflicted because if you put all these together, if you do have therm runaway, then you get very easy propagation. One of the ways to prevent that is to have more spacing between the cells, possibly put some material between them to insulate them or heat sink them. And so you, you're really battling the energy density and, and some of the safety and management type issues. So what happens when you have a uh, thermal runaway in one of these cells in a, in a large cluster? Well, the first cell that goes off, you're starting at ambient temperature. So it takes a lot of its own energy to heat up. And at that time, it's also heating its, its nearest neighbor cells. If, that, if propagation occurs, if you're not able to stop that reaction from heating to the second cell, when the second cell starts to go off, now you have proximal heating, not only from the second cell, oops, but also the first cell. And so the, the cells adjacent to the second cell will start to heat up even more rapidly because they've been preheated by the first cell and now they're getting heating from the second cell. So this starts to happen more and more rapidly and you get a, a really fast reaction and, and uh, a lot of energy release. So going back to the stochasticity of this, here are two nail penetration tests on nominally the same design. And so the first one is the same video we saw before. Puncture it. There is gas coming out where the nail is, but most of the gas came out at the cap, at the vent mechanism. That's where it's designed to release its, um, its material uh, based on the, the vent disc that it has built in. The second test, though, it looks like that's kind of uh, pausing a little bit, but um, basically, no venting at all happened at the cap in this one. Instead, all of it came out the side, so you had a side rupture. In fact, we did many of these tests, and here's a, a three, for example. The first one is the first test you saw, and it vented out the top, which is where it's designed to release that. So these cylindrical cells have a burst disc. If, uh, if you have overpressurization, it's made to come out that, at that end. The second two, uh, they all vented adjacent to or, or nearby the nail pen. Um, and so obviously, the fact that you penetrate it with a nail has a, a huge influence on that. But the fact is that these tests were run in the same way and you get a different type of, uh, of, of a failure mode. Um, now, going back to the, the state of charge and how you saw you didn't see much mass loss difference between the different cells in a pouch cell design, that's also you, you can see consistent with this test where the, the highest mass loss was actually in the, in the cell that vented as designed. And so mass loss is not necessarily a bad thing. If you can, if you have a way of channeling those gases and channeling that ejecta away from the other cells, then your total heat capacity and can be managed. And so you can pr hopefully prevent that from propagating to other cells. So looking at this, there's a, a diagram. If the cell vents as designed, this, uh, the vent gases come out the top, you can imagine that might be easier to manage than if it starts to vent into its nearest neighbors. Uh, and if you start to have this side venting, uh, which can happen for a number of reasons, uh, for example, when you have an external short, that 
the thermal runaway reaction itself actually happens when that drives an internal short. That internal short location from that external short can occur at any location within the cell. Well, if it happens to occur near the edge of a cell, then that'll weaken the can. It'll reduce the, the yield stress. And so when you get overpressurization inside, that location might be weaker than the top vent and result in side venting. If you imagine similarly, if one cell side vents, it's going to attack the other cells on the side, weaken their sides, and could also result in additional side venting. And so these things are influenced by the cell design, whether you have one vent, two vent, um, how thick the can walls are, but also how you're, how you're working and managing the heat if you do have propagation uh, or thermal away in one cell, how are you managing that, the other cells and their exposure to that heat? Also just dependent on the, the age and state of uh, charge of the cell. So in this particular case, we initiated uh, a cell in the middle of a cluster. It experienced a side uh, venting. You can see here the initiator vented out the cap and the side. Uh, because of this, four of the six neighboring cells also had side vents. So again, not hard to imagine if you basically put a cutting torch and blow into the side of a cell, it's going to vent out uh, that side rather than uh, out, out its top where it's designed to do. So then how do you use this information to design a battery pack? Well, there are a few different mitigation strategies. Uh, thermal is one. So in the pack in the upper right, you can see you have a, an array of cylindrical cells. And then you have this pink uh, material, which is basically that the annular region between those closed pack pattern of cells is filled with this foam. So in this particular design, the thermal strategy was to insulate the cells. And if you can insulate the cells well enough, then you can prevent the heat transfer from one cell to going thermal runaway to its neighbor uh, to the point that hopefully it won't, uh, it won't propagate. And in these large packs, they're often designed such that if one cell experiences thermal runaway, the pack, which has a whole bunch of cells in parallel, you can see all these have the same orientation with the, the positive pointing down. So these are all at the same voltage. They're all tied together in one, um, one bank. And so these are designed that if you lose one cell, it's able to continue to operate. You also can do the opposite. You can use heat sinking. Uh, you, sometimes people put phase change materials between the cells to absorb that heat if you have a thermal runaway reaction. There have been packs that use liquid cooling that are uh, channeled through the annular region between these cylindrical cells. Uh, also, it's, you can have forced air cooling. So in a cylindrical design, it gives you a lot of options that way. If you go to more of a prismatic or a pouch cell design, it's, uh, you have fewer options. Uh, because again, you're trying to maximize energy density. And so you stack all these up to use all the space, as you can see in the lower right. But if you don't have barriers between and space between those cells, then it, it can be very difficult to prevent propagation. So in this one, uh, on the lower right, they actually use some kind of a urethane to, so once the pack was made, they actually uh, in encase the whole thing in a, in a urethane to try to, uh, to manage the uh, thermal runaway. You can also manage propagation electrically. Uh, so in the lower left, you can see you have these small wires connected to the bus bars so that all of these cells that are connected in parallel, if you were to have an internal short in one cell, what happens is because all the cells are at the same voltage, the cells that haven't been shorted will all dump their energy into the cell that, that suffers the short circuit. And so if you don't have, if you have a large bus bar connecting them, then all of that energy can be dumped into the cell that has a short circuit and it's more likely to, to experience their runaway. But if you have these small fuse type designs on these ligaments, then that current, when one cell experiences short circuit, will be cut off as these uh, links will fuse open. Um, so similar to the, we talked about venting in cylindrical cells, each of the tops of these will have a vent design. You also need to accommodate that mechanically in the design of your pack. Because as you start to have uh, cells that go to thermal runaway and maybe propagate, they're gonna generate a large volume of gas. And so you need to be able to uh, make sure that doesn't become an explosive event at the pack level. And so you also need to develop, uh, generate mechanical vents um, at, the, at the pack level to accommodate those types of things. So the first line of, uh, of defense against uh, propagation and thermal runaway is to prevent thermal runaway at all uh, from happening. And you can do that through cell design uh, and pack design. So, but in addition to that, you also can do that through uh, how you manage that uh, in the use of the battery pack. So we, you remembering back to when I said 2013 versus 2018 cells, you can actually get the 2018 cells to behave just like the 2013 cells if you back off the state of charge. 
And so that's what a, some electric vehicle manufacturers will do is that they actually won't use the full capacity of, of the cell. If you only charge to 70, 75% state of charge, then any reactions that could cause them runaway in an individual cell are much easier to manage. And your cycle life can improve from you know, something that might be 500, 1,000 cycles can get you easily to 10,000 cycles. Super important considerations in pack design, cell selection. Obviously, you want to use top tier manufacturers. Uh, you need spacing between the cells. Again, it's a battle between energy density and, and having that spacing to allow you to, uh, to manage the thermal uh, heat transfer between them. Vent gas management, how are you moving that gas away from the cells and away from the pack? Uh, whether you need thermal barriers between cells and different banks of cells or whether you want to actually heat sink them. Obviously, electrical shutoffs we talked about. You can do that at individual cell levels. You can do that at block levels and at pack levels. And then mechanical protection. Obviously, when you get into any devices that are going to be dropped, uh, when you get to electric vehicles where you have crashes, you need to make sure that you don't impinge on the cells and cause uh, these kinds of catastrophic reactions. Once you have your design and it's in the field, it's super important that you start to gather data. Um, and this becomes more and more important the larger the system you're dealing with. We've had, we've investigated fires where there are literally thousands and thousands of cells involved in a fire. And the traditional methodology of taking the initiating cell, identifying it out of a group of, you know, maybe uh, five cells or out of 15 cells, it's not so challenging. But if you're trying to identify the initiator by looking at every single cell among thousands of cells, it's really challenging, especially if the fire has been so great that they're they, now a whole bunch of just electrodes and um, junk all over the floor. It's very hard to reconstruct that. So if you're able to look at the data real time, then you can start to pick out where the, the incident may have started. And if you're monitoring the correct things, you're monitoring voltage of each bank, the capacity of, of the different banks, temperature at various locations, um, and, and the charge efficiency, those types of things, then you can start to manage that um, and uh, identify early before you get a thermal runaway, you can start to identify some markers and, and manage those systems. Um, and through that, you can limit the, the state of charge. To, if you're starting to see some stresses going on, you can reduce the state of charge um, at full charge. You can also deactivate certain modules to help limit your risk. Um, and so again, data management, now that we were able to uh, monitor and, and control big data, uh, the more data you can, you can take from your system, the better, because you're able to identify trends and possibly put in algorithms that will, uh, will identify issues before they actually start. But it's super important that the quality of that data is good and that you're monitoring not only batteries after they fail, but actually when they're in the field, so you can hopefully identify these and, uh, and, and pull them out and get them shut down before they have any uh, catastrophic reactions. Uh, also very important to compare the, the performance of, of different packs um, that are in operation. So how frequent do you have thermal runaway? Well, the numbers that are thrown around is, you know, it's about one in 10 million to one in 40 million cells at a cell level if you have a top tier manufacturer. So it's super rare, um, but it's still not something that is perfect. Even though these have been made since the mid nineties, it's still not a commodity. They still have these catastrophic failures. And then if you think about uh, a car where you have thousands of cells. In fact, in the Tesla Model 3 with an 82 kilowatt hour pack, you have 4,600 cells. It doesn't take much math to figure out you're going to get this kind of catastrophic reaction in about one in 2,000 to one in 5,000 cars. And so if the whole car burns up out of every two or 5,000 cars, that's just not acceptable. And so you really need to design for cell failures. You need to assume that cells will fail. We're going to try to prevent it. We're going to do everything we can to prevent th uh, that from happening. But we also need to design a system that either through heat sinking or thermal management, won't let the cell go thermal or protect that thermal uh, management so that if it does go thermal, that it won't propagate to the neighboring cells and, and uh, create a large chain reaction. Wrapping up here before Elenia, it will, will go into talk uh, shortly about modeling. Um, it is important to take the data that we've learned through accelerator rate calorimetry, through various different um, tests that you do, and, and feed that back and start to very early on in your pack design, uh, model how your thermal reactions happen. Uh, and so you can start with reduced order models to simplify that problem and evaluate how you get cell to cell propagation and how that propagation can then move from a small problem to a large problem. 
Um, and that's going to be the focus of uh, Elenia's talk, which I'm very excited to, to listen to here shortly. Um, but wrapping things up here, key takeaways. Preventing thermal runaway is not trivial. It's not just a matter of making sure you have the best manufacturing process in the world. Really, it takes a lot of thinking, a lot of design, mechanical, electrical, thermal, um, in addition to best manufacturing practices. You have to design a battery pack with the assumption you will have failures of cells. And you have to do everything you can to then try to prevent those from becoming a larger failure, especially on systems where you're designing, uh, you're integrating hundreds or even thousands of cells. And finally, testing under various different expected use and abuse conditions for new and used cells can really provide a lot of great data that you can use then when you're monitoring real-time data in your system and help designers and integrators uh, then use that to develop battery packs. With that, I uh, want to, uh, again, uh, thank Nick Fanza for helping to put these slides together. And uh, uh, thank you for, for listening. Fantastic, Troy. Thank you very much for that uh, survey of uh, thermal runaway in your case studies. Um, so I, I want to just kick off with a few general questions. Um, so most of the examples that you described were in the context of electric vehicles. Um, is is that uh, is that accurate, or do you? I mean, I think it was a pretty um, pretty notable example before of uh, consumer electron, ele consumer electronics with iPhones and, and so on. So, I'm just want to comment a little bit about sort of the different applications and thermal runaway. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly we, at Exponent, I would say we we cut our teeth on on thermal runaways of uh, of batteries and consumer electronics and starting there. Um, and as I said, we we work on. Uh, all, all types of scale. So in my personal projects, I have literally, I'm working on a battery that is, is implanted in the skull of an implantable medical device. Um, I'm also working right now on a grid scale storage. And so really the same, uh, the same considerations apply to all scales of systems. In one case, you're talking about uh, how does heat transfer to bone and to the, the, the matter inside of the, the, the skull cavity. Um, in another case, you're talking about how you're transferring energy through these, these giant uh, banks of, of cells. But ultimately, the process of thermal runaway and the management of, of those thermal issues um, is, is equally important in, in, the different, in the different cases. Obviously, the big scale systems release a lot more energy, and so they, they tend yeah. to be uh, more on the news. Yeah. So in that context, then, um, are you seeing any... Uh, are the different uh, types of cells, prismatic, um, pouch, um, cylindrical. Do you see any differences in, in thermal runaway potential of those formats? Yeah, certainly the pouch cells. Um, so if you look at the different electric vehicle manufacturers, there, there isn't a standard form factor that's chosen. Uh, Tesla tends to use cylindrical cells. Um, but if you look at uh, Ford and GM, they're using large pouch cells. Um, pouch cells, uh, they they definitely release energy differently, as we talked about. The venting is more diffuse around the edges, uh, which can be helpful in certain circumstances. But in my experience, it's also very hard to to limit heat transfer between cells if you don't have a gap, right? So that the having those annular regions between cylindrical cells provides a natural cavity that you can use for thermal management. And so, in designs that use pouch cells, they really have to figure out how much spacing and do you need to put ceramic between each pouch cell. Uh, but ultimately, anything you get, you're creating those gaps, you're reducing the energy density. And so it's always a balance. You need to, to find the perfect balance where we have all the thermal management you need, but the, you, you have the energy density to be able to you know, have your, your pickup drive 600 miles or whatever it is. Yeah, so there is a, well, I, I guess there's a general perception, especially when I talk to, general, to the public right now, that, the, um, that the, there seems to be a greater number of recalls with uh, electric vehicles. And I'm, as someone who's probably uh, in this all the time, do you perceive that that's the case um, compared to say internal combustion engines? Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit, uh, but I'm curious on your assessment. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. Yeah, there, there's certainly been some very high profile recalls. Um, we're, we're still learning how to do this, right? That's, that's true. Um, and one of the things I think is distinct between a, an internal combustion engine fire and uh, electric vehicle fire. I mean, there, there are still a lot of uh, internal combustion engine fires, but there's a couple of differences. One, when a fire and internal combustion engine happens, once the fire is over, it's over. Uh, one of the, the keys about in, the lithium-ion batteries is if you're successful at preventing propagation, 
but you had partial propagation of a battery pack, now you've got, let's say, part of an electric vehicle that has had full therm runaway, but an, an adjacent module that you're able to stop the reaction before it did, maybe through first responders or what have you. But now the adjacent module it can be thermally damaged. It can have all kinds of water ingress. And so there can be a, a failure that is going to be delayed a matter of hours or days. And so there's all kinds of stories in the news where you have an uh, electric vehicle that a fire, they put the fire out several hours or days later, it catches fire again and again and again. So that's one difference. Um, and another is a lot of the fires with, with lithium-ion batteries in general, by and large, start during charging. So it's when you charge a lithium-ion battery, you get expansion of the electrodes. And so your wear through type failures related to stress often happen during charge. That coupled with the fact your highest state of charge, where you have the most energy to pour into a fault, happens when it's charged. Well, where do you do charging electric vehicles? They're at home. So a lot of electric vehicle fires are happening around residential areas as opposed to on a freeway or somewhere where it's, where it's less catastrophic. So there's a lot of sense of sensitivity to that. Um, but just like autonomous driving, it's kind of in the spotlight right now. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to, to make that right. But, you know, obviously we don't have the experience with, as we do with internal combustion at this point. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. I think um, one of the things that uh, I, I maybe you can just um, give your thoughts on this. What are the common root causes of thermal runaway? So you mentioned charging or, uh, and then in some cases a collision or something. What do you see as sort of the uh, example of, root causes that might be related, uh, degradation, whatever, you know, what are you, what do you see are the mechanisms for the thermal runaway? Um, and that also goes back, Jimmy, to your question about the different, uh, how different cells behave. So if you have a cylindrical cell, because the can is very robust, um, even if you were to drop it or have some mechanical stress on the outside, it doesn't usually cause a, cat a catastrophic failure. But if you imagine you just have a soft pouch, like you have in your, you know, whatever cell phone you have in your pocket, if you do something to crush that, the cell is, is a soft vacuum pack bag. And so what we've seen is at, in cells that, that are pouch cell design, there's a much higher percentage of thermal runaways that are external to the, the cell itself. So whether that's during pack assembly or during use, because it has a soft bag, um, it's much easier to cause a failure. In fact, if you look at the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 recall, one of the two failure modes was Basically, the enclosure in the phone didn't have enough room for expansion electrodes. And because it didn't have a hard case, that basically impinged on the edge of the windings. So on pouches, uh, external mechanical environment is super important. Um, but regardless of design, there are a, a lot of different commonalities. One is you know, thermal. It, it, obviously, you can have external heat attack. Um, and when you look at fires, uh, lithium-ion batteries, because it's very uh, well known in the news, they can catch fire then we find they're quickly pointed to in, in fires because they're a hotspot, right? Even if you had, regardless of the start, if you have an uh, electric vehicle in your garage and the fire propagates there, that's gonna be a super hotspot. And so um, that certainly thermal uh, can set things off. Degradation, you know, one of the super important things is the electrode balance between your positive and negative electrode. You need to have more capacity in your anode, your negative electrode than your cathode so when you fully charge, you don't get plated lithium on the surface of your anode. Um, and all the cell manufacturers know that. But one of the things that can happen is if your electrodes age um, disproportionately, and if, if your anode ages more quickly than your cathode, all of a sudden you're, you can't accommodate all of the, the lithium during charge, and you can get plating even on a cell that was balanced well originally. Uh, lithium plating also can be exacerbated if you have you know, charging at low temperatures, um, if you're charging at too high a rate, um, charging a cell, maybe you could do a 1C, uh, a char you know, charge in an hour on a cell when it was new, but because of degradation, um, your lithium transport is somehow inhibited and can result in lithium plating. So lithium plating is a common cause of, uh, of failures. You can get uh, dendritic growths and things like that. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of different uh, failure modes, electrical, if you don't uh, manage your charge algorithm properly, um, if you, you don't manage discharge, um, and of course, mechanical. So it's, it's quite a diff few different reasons. And then of course, uh, internal manufacturing uh, can also, uh, some of the recalls we're talking about electric vehicles, uh, the, the battery manufacturers pointed to manufacturing issues on the, on the line that, that cause those failures. So certainly they can, they can cause failures as well. Okay, so um, I, I imagine from your comments and that uh, this uh, transition potentially to fast charging would 
that uh, need to be done carefully uh, since that the, the charging rate could play a role in this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, because it, it, again, it's not a constant target. You you have a fast charge rate that you verified on a brand new cell. Is a cell yeah. with you know 10,000 cycles still gonna be able to accommodate that fast rate of charge? And so then it goes back to what I was talking about with, with data analysis. If you're able to characterize, for example, the, the impedance of the cell and the charge efficiency, then you can start to suss out some of those characteristics that you know need to reach a, be at a certain minimum level in order to accommodate that fast charge. So it might be your fast charging will be able to get, you know, what do they say, 80% in 10 minutes when it's brand new, but maybe in, you know, if it's a five-year-old car, maybe it's 80% in 20 minutes. Um, so it's really important that you consider that with the lifetime of the cell. Do, do you believe right now that there are adequate uh, sensors that could give you that kind of insight that you might have potential issues uh, that uh, that are in place right now where you can flag in and potentially replace uh, a particular uh, uh, pack or module or, or as, as appropriate? Yeah, I mean, there certainly sensors exist and the measurements exist, but it's always just like your energy density, it's a balance. Are you gonna put in, if you have uh, 10,000 cells in your, in your car, well, it'd be great if you had 10,000 thermocouples and if you were able to measure, obviously they're in parallel, so you can't measure individual impedances, but you know, there's a limit on how much you're going to put into measurement. Uh, on test packs, you certainly could, but you need to balance that. And so you need to find the sweet spot of finding those key locations um, and, and what data you need. But, but you know, we're learning as well. And um, as the manufacturers are, are kind of learning what is the most important measurement, then they're putting that into the, the, uh, the firmware and, and updating these algorithms so they're more and more accurate at detecting failures. Um, once a failure happens, often that's a, a learning process. And so then they could feed that back and say, okay, now we're looking at the data. Look at this, we see this spike just before failure. Can we then implement that into our uh, systems that are still in the field to say, if you start to see that ramp up, then we back off the charge or we, we disable the pack. Yeah, so a, a really sort of high level question to, to end it. You know, we're more marching down this, um, this path of electrification. And uh, where now we see energy storage devices at uh, not to, you know, mobile, uh, stationary electric vehicles across the board, uh, potentially even considering energy storage uh, in residential to offset, you know, disruptions. Um, how, how do you see or how would you recommend, uh, you know, there's, there's a big concern as we start down this path uh, that there are things we're learning, as you put it, that we're still learning, right? And so uh, a general, general uh, question long, you know, how, how would you orchestrate this so that we have um, a more smooth transition and minimize or leverage our learnings across the various use cases? It seems like application is a big deal here. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because you're, you, Obviously, if you had everyone adopting the same form factor in the same battery pack, we could do a lot to, to make that efficient. But ultimately, I think you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and that goes for clean energy. It goes for, for batteries. Um, and so really, one of the things that's super important, and it's, it's not really the topic of this, this talk, but you know, how are we making this green really green? If you're driving your Tesla and you feel like, I've got an EV, I've well, if you're using fossil fuels to charge it, how green is that? If you didn't extract lithium in a way that's good for the environment, then you're just kind of moving the, 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 the bad effects away from your neighborhood. And so that whole process, and they're starting to have, um, you know, you can have QR codes that looks to make sure you have basically like conflict-free lithium. And, and these things are going to be more and more important to make sure that as, an, as a whole, as a world, we're actually improving through this technology. And so that's really, it has to be addressed from all angles. And I think lithium ion batteries is currently the big bet that the world's made. You know, with fuel cells and other things, I think that, you know, we shouldn't just discount and say, okay, lithium is what it is. We need to keep building and look for non-organic electrolytes and, and, and keep pushing forward, but, but don't forget about these other things where we might be able to make a big difference. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you, Troy. Thank you for the presentations and discussion. And... Uh, I'd like to now introduce our second speaker, and we'll bring you back, Troy, uh, after uh, we have the presentation by Lenia. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our second speaker is Lenia Batiato, who's an associate professor uh, here at Stanford in the energy science and engineering uh, as part of the new Door School of Sustainability. Um, Dr. Dr. Batiato's uh, research focuses on understanding, modeling, and predicting 
complex multi-scale multi-physics systems with cross-cutting applications in the energy landscape, ranging from electrochemical storage to CO2 sequestration and hydrogen storage in the subsurface. She uses a combination of rigorous mathematical theories, numeric and symbolic computing to develop advanced multi-scale multi-physics model. She attained an MS in environmental engineering with highest honors from the Politecnico di Milano, Italy in 2005. She subsequently obtained an MS in engineering physics uh, from the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department of the University of California, San Diego. And she completed her PhD in 2010 at uh, UCSD also. She received the DOE Young Investigator Award in basic energy science for innovative work on multi-scale models in porous media. With that, welcome, Elenia. I'm Elenia Battiato. I lead the multi-scale physics in energy system group uh, in the Department of Energy Science and Engineering at Stanford. And today I'm going to talk about some of the work that we have recently done in the context of thermal runaway and in particular about upscaling and automation um, and how we can use uh, and advance our understanding and modeling of multi-scale of, um, of uh, thermal runaway through symbolic and numeric computing. And I know this is uh, a lot, it's a mouthful. I would like to emphasize just three concepts from that title, thermal runaway, multi-scale modeling, and symbolic and numerical computing. So thanks to uh, Troy, we now know everything we need to know about thermal runaway. So thank you, Troy. Um, uh, I, in this talk, I'm going to focus on multi-scale modeling and symbolic and numerical computing. And uh, the claim of this talk will be that battery systems present unique modeling challenges because they are multi-scale and multi-physics systems. However, we can capitalize on their very multi-scale nature through novel technologies in symbolic and numerical computing to achieve predictive accuracy while not compromising on computational costs. Uh, and I want to link back quickly to one slide that Troy showed towards the end, where essentially he showed numerical simulations of thermal runaway uh, in um, a group of cells, I think it was about 60, um, and the importance of developing um, compute accurate accurate computational models because really computer-aided design can significantly reduce um, the cost of um, uh, you know, making design choices while uh, ensuring accuracy and safety. And so uh, really the need is to um, develop accurate predictive models for computer-aided design. Uh, on the top, I have here um, a picture of a, a Tesla battery pack you can see that there are over 7,000 cells uh, in this particular design. Uh, and then here we see uh, a module. It contains over 400 batteries. And then this is just um, a zoomed in um, view of uh, how it, you know, we can conceptualize it as uh, containing three domains, uh, the battery cell, which is the pink domain, then the white domain, which represents the packing material where these batteries essentially are being encased, and then a third domain, which could be, for example, cooling pipes. And we know that thermal runaway, as uh, Troy explained, it can be caused by a number of different causes. Uh, one of them is the um, onset of exothermal reactions that increase the temperature of the, of the battery, uh, which speeds up the reaction process uh, and that leads uh, to this catastrophic e event where one cell can undergo thermal runaway and then um, this can propagate down to uh, neighboring cells, um, causing uh, essentially complete destruction of a number of different cells or even the entire pack. And so um, prevention clearly is critical. Um, and from a, a computer-aided design point of view, uh, maybe some of the questions that we would like to be able to address is what are the best geometric parameters for preventing re thermal runaway? Um, and can, for example, minimize cooling pipes usage by optimizing unit cell geometry? Uh, or uh, for example, what kind of uh, uh, material should we use for the packing uh, in a way that uh, we can, again, uh, reduce thermal runaway or uh, the chances of the risk of thermal runaway. Now, why are lithium-ion batteries multi-scale multi-physics systems? So we refer to a multi-physics system uh, as a system that uh, in which a number of different physical processes occur concurrently 
and are coupled together. Uh, so in this particular case for batteries, we know that we may have, uh, you know, we have lithium ion intercalation, the intercalation reaction. We have uh, diffusion in the electrolyte, in the solid phase, we have electrode, uh, electrokinetic effects. We have um, uh, um, uh, heat transfer. We can have, uh, you know, uh, uh, mechanics deformation. Batteries are also uh, severely multi-scale systems. From material science, we know that a lot of design actually goes into uh, uh, the materials design of the electrode uh, particles, and this is typically a very fine scale, right? It's submicron scale. However, the performance of the system uh, uh, that we are really focused on goes up to the meter scale. So we're interested in really how this design at very small scale and intermediate design at the cell scale or, or uh, module scale can really affect the performance of the entire battery pack. So in terms of uh, spatial scales that we have to cover in order to be able to develop models at the system scale, it's really technically six or seven orders of magnitude at least. For time, things becomes even more complicated because re reactions may have characteristic temporal scales of milliseconds, while you know aging uh, can occur over months or years. And so that leads us easily to seven to 10 orders of magnitude in time. Uh, so the development of rigorous and predictive system, scale, system scales model from first principle is highly technical, it's time consuming and prone to, uh, prone to error. But now really, what is the specific challenge uh, to model such systems rigorously? Um, so clearly, if we start, for, for example, from uh, the module scale, we could use a high fidelity model uh, where we do we would solve um, you know our model uh, in this very intricate domain. Now the advantage of using fine scale uh, or high fidelity models is that these are you know accurate. We have confidence in the models or equations that describe processes at this particular scale. But the problem is that they are computationally ex expensive. Uh, I'm assuming that the simulation that Troy showed uh, just for 60 cells must have taken quite a bit of computational time. However, now we are really thinking about modeling systems that have two orders of magnitude, uh, larger number of cells. So we are going from 60 to 7,000. And so an option to overcome this issue is to say, well, we don't really maybe need to use these high fidelity simulations at this level of granularity. Instead, we can try to build equivalent representations or reduced order models or equivalent continuum representations. These are, I'm going to use all these terms kind of interchangeably, where essentially now my very fine scale domain can be represented as equivalent continua, where the pink domain will give me information about the average temperature of the battery domain, while the white domain will give me information about the average temperature of the packing domain, for example. Now, the advantage of using these equivalent or representations or upscaled representation or reduced order models um, is that they are computationally cheap. Um, because the domain is much simpler, I can resolve it uh, pretty well with lower computational uh, burden. However, the model themselves, so the partial differential equations that we need to employ or solve will be approximate. So having control on the approximation error uh, becomes very critical, especially because safety um, is involved. Uh, and the process of deriving and determining this equivalent representation from their accurate high fidelity models happens can be done rigorously through some mathematical theories that are broadly indicated or represented by upscaling theories. Um, so, and that's where the, the, the difficulty is. So we start from some governing equations that we uh, have confidence on, but we really want to determine what are the models or the reduced order models that we can deploy with accuracy at a scale such that we can accuracy, but, but we can also retain a computational efficiency. So the objectives of the work that we are doing is really to, to develop a complete multi-scale modeling strategy that includes model development, model verification, and validation. And we would like certain very specific features of this framework. We would like to have fast development time. We don't want this framework to be developed in, there we go. I'm sorry. 
uh, in um, uh, you know 10 years uh, so we want it fast we want again controlled accuracy uh, for a priori estimates of the error, because we want models that are reliable when deployed. We want computational efficiency, and we want also transferability and framework generality. What we mean by this is that if we develop a framework for a specific physical process, we would like to be able to have the flexibility to generalize, to include additional processes. As Troy mentioned, the, the reason for thermal runaway can be varied, and so we would like to have that flexibility to include additional physics as um, uh, we uh, improve the generality. Now, the three type of questions that I'm going to address in this talk are what are these continuum scale models? What are these reduced order models? How do they look like? Uh, when are these models reliable? And what are our strategies when uh, we cannot use them uh, to do computer aided design? And so in our group, really, we look at the entire life cycle of multi-scale model development uh, for different engineering applications. Again, we have the left branch is the physics-based model deployment. These are strategies where we essentially develop models rigorously, mathematically. Uh, we also identify during these mathematical procedures uh, the applicability conditions under which these models can predict fine-scale processes correctly and accurately. So these applicability conditions are, are then turned into what we call diagnosis criteria for the model. And we use then this diagnosis criteria for optimal model deployment. Um, for example, um, we would like to understand, you know, for certain specific application, um, what would be, be the best model to use? And the deployment should be optimal in terms of two parameters, accuracy and computational cost. And so this is just a snapshot, not updated of the people who have uh, who we have in the group. Um, really, we focus generally on multi-scale, multi-physics uh, modeling of engineering systems, and we have a specific focus and strength in fluid mechanics, heat transfer, reactive transport, broadly in engineering physics, numerical methods, algorithm, and machine learning and AI. I didn't put applied math, but that's kind of implied. Uh, so, however, today I'm going to um, talk about the work that two ex-members have done um, in the context of Thermal Runaway. Uh, Dr. Yao is now assistant professor at Texas A&M, and Dr. Petrick, who is a Lawrence Fellow at Lawrence uh, Livermore National Lab, and Xi Jinping, who is currently a student in the group. So let's start with the first few questions. So what are the continuum scale model equations, the reduced order model equations that we should be using? When are they reliable? And how can symbolic computing help? Uh, so, as I mentioned, this uh, translation between high fidelity model and reduced order models can be rigorously performed through us upscaling methods. These are a class of mathematical theories that can get us what we need. So, they can help us generate the mathematical models that, uh, uh, that we need, and they also help us identify the conditions under which the specific model is valid and predictive, which we, which we call applicability conditions. So the general idea of these models are that, let's say that we have a description at a fine scale, we identify and or define a volume, which we call representative elementary volume. And then based on this volume, we can define an average. In this particular case, since we are looking at thermal runaway, the, the quantity of interest that psi would be temperature. So we can define an average temperature as an integral over this volume. And then the general goal is the following. So let's say that we have a high fidelity model. So the temperature of the, of the cell satisfies a certain, uh, a certain partial differential equation, a certain models. Then the idea is that you apply this averaging operator to this partial differential equation. And then with some math, math that is all hidden behind this simple arrow, what, you're, what you want is a, actually another model that now holds for the average temperature. And so once we have this model, that's our reduced order model, our continuum model, then we can solve it numerically, it's much cheaper, and then we can, of course, make predictions at large scale. And there are different methods that you can use to perform this procedure. We generally use homogenization theory, but all other methods would give you roughly the same information. Now, the idea then is that, okay, if we know the physics at this particular scale, for example, at this um, uh, cell, cell scale, then we can derive uh, our, uh, our upscaled models. For the, um, 
for this particular scale and thermal runaway, then we can have, for example, a conduction equation that describes a temperature evolution in the packing material and another conduction equation in the, in the cells. Um, but now the difference is that we have a heat generation term that Troy was talking about, um, where essentially this heat generation term can be characterized experimentally. And the way it looks, it's generally something like this, where the battery uh, generates some heat. It's like low level heat up to a certain temperature. But when the temperature of the battery reaches a certain values, then the heat generated ramps up. Uh, so the battery undergoes thermal runaway. The temperature continues increasing until you get complete burnout, at which case, essentially, the cell is dead and does not generate any heat. And then, of course, you have technical boundary conditions uh, that represent how these domains are connected thermically. Now, of course, as, as we mentioned before, we can always solve uh, these partial differential equations, these models uh, on our complex domain. And we, with these equations, we can both model an ignition scenario and the non-ignition scenario. So on the left hand, you see an non-ignition case where we uh, mm, uh, have the, cent the cell in the center undergo thermal runaway, but you see that the heat is propagated through the pack, but it does not activate the other cells to go into thermal runaway. In on the other case, instead, we have an ignition case where the first cell again fails, undergoes thermal runaway, but this heat is propagated throughout and triggers thermal runaway and the catastrophic event that in fact uh, affects all the battery pack. So uh, the the problem with those simulations is that, as I mentioned before, they are very expensive. So we can use these, the these theories, these upscaling theories, to derive reduced order models. And we have everything in place to do that. We can do systematic generation of macroscopic differential equation. And we can also use this theory um, to develop multi-scale models that seamlessly connect adjacent scales. So we technically require no, paramet no parameter fitting a coarser scale if you have the appropriate information, a finer scale. However, the problem is that really those mathematical derivations that I um, hid behind this arrow are incredibly complex. They are tedious, time-consuming, prone to error. And if we also want to derive the applicability conditions of, of these models, uh, which tell us when these equivalent representations are actually accurate, that can take months or years of derivations. So, and when I say it's bad, I really mean it. So this is just an example of the results of some of these upscaling theories and the derivations is not present. Um, so our suggestion here is to essentially automate. We want to get accurate models at the appropriate scale that are, uh, that are cheap to solve computationally, but we don't want to have to do these calculations by hand. And so we want to use symbolic computation to automate the entire um, uh, de model development uh, of these complex systems. So now the concept of using symbolic computation is not new. In fact, it was first introduced by a woman, Ada Augusta in Countess, uh, of Lovelace in 1842, and she uh, took, um, she was highly educated, she took notes uh, on uh, the writings of Babbage concerning his um, analytical engine, which is considered the first computer, and one of these uh, notes reads as follows. So many persons who are not conversant with mathematical studies imagine that because the business of the Babbage's analytical engine is to give its results in numerical notation, the nature of his processes must be consequently arithmetical and numerical rather than algebraical and analytical. This is an error. The engine can arrange and combine its numerical quantities exactly as if they were letters or any other general symbols. And in fact, he might bring out its results in algebraic notation, notation where provisions made accordingly. And so the idea here was really to use symbolic computing to automate the upscaling procedure. Um, symbolic computing is the science and technology that aims at automating a wide range of processes involved in solving problems in mathematical physics. 
And the symbolic computing has been used routinely in a number of other branches of applied and theoretical math and computer science. But for some reason, this tool had never been involved um, in or used to advance high level ma manipulations of uh, in um, uh, mathematical physics. And so that's precisely was our point. Uh, we wanted to automate all these upscaling procedure um, that are very important to develop rigorous uh, equivalent representations for these more complex processes. And so we have done this through a code, um, uh, Symbolica. This is a symbolic software developed in Mathematica, which automates uh, completely the upscaling procedure. And so the idea is that, again, we have a fine scale, high fidelity model that can look as ugly as you want. Then we want to build the model at the continuum scale, uh, which we may, we may not know how it looks like. And again, this, if we were doing it by hand, would take months to years to derive. But now we don't want to do that. We want to allocate all the computational resources to Symbolica, and we speed up the process by five orders of magnitude. So we now can develop models that are accurate and predictive in seconds. Uh, Symbolica has this underlying algorithmic structure that I'm not going to discuss, but essentially, if you check Symbolica in action for the thermal runaway problem, it provides you with this re re reduced order model in 62 seconds. Now, uh, I'm not going to discuss the PDEs that are on this page, but I want to just highlight that these PDEs, these uh, reduced order models, first of all, are not, you know, very easy to um, derive, or even uh, they contain terms that we would have not expected to have. Uh, we started from a standard conduction equation, and now we see effective advection that appears ad in addition with other terms uh, that um, look even more complex. It turns out that this effective advection is exactly the term that mathematically can model the propagation of a thermal front at the continuum scale that would happen if you had thermal runaway. And so, of course, now we get these models. Uh, they are produced by essentially our algorithm, but how do we check if they are uh, correct? So we perform a full uh, numerical verification. In this particular case, we do a verification case where we have batteries that have all the same heat generation profile. And we uh, perform full four scale simulations. This is our benchmark uh, and truth. Uh, and then we compare with the reduced order models that Symbolica provided. Um, if you can see on the left, the average temperature as a function of time, this is, is a perfect match between the poor scale, the fine scale high fidelity simulation, and the continuum scale. But our uh, modeling, actually, our verification step. Uh, is uh, very stringent, and um, we are not just happy to see uh, a visual uh, coincidence, but we actually check the error. So we call, we say that the model, an, an equivalent model is fully verified only if the error actually is bounded by the theoretical error that is prescribed by the theory. So if the error between the two simulations is below this red line, then it's a verified case. So we can do also more complex cases. In this case, we have uh, batteries that have different um, heat generation profiles. The battery to the left uh, are already undergoing thermal runaway that then causes the heat propagates to the right and then causes the other side of the battery pack to undergo thermal runaway. And again, we see that if you, if you calculate the uh, error, we are all uh, under the uh, theoretical bounds. Uh, we can even do a full-scale thermal uh, runaway analysis, where again we have, uh, you know, half of the side that has already undergone thermal runaway, uh, and then the heat propagates to uh, the right hand side, and we see that we can capture again the behavior. But the fundamental difference is that a full high fidelity simulation takes 10 days to run in serial, while while this reduced order model with accuracy guaranteed takes less than a day. So, of course, once the models have been validated, now we can start making um, observations or analysis that maybe could guide design principles. Um, and the reason why we can do that is only because um, we can now rerun all these, uh, calculate all these reduced order models while changing parameters of interest. Uh, I would like to emphasize that the reduced order model that you obtain 
is dependent on the parameters uh, and the physical um, uh, description of your system. So if we change thermal properties of the battery cell and packing materials or the thermal resistance of the insulation layer or the heating generation profile of batteries and the state of charge, then the equation that you would use might be different. But at this point, we do not care because we can essentially uh, run and derive these models instantaneously for all these different combinations. And the reason why we don't want to do it by hand is because that's how it looks. So this is just a conceptualization of um, how the models can change depending on the parameters. Um, and now because of Symbolica, we can have essentially all these different models and look at um, how the different parameters can affect the response at the continuum scale. Uh, we can even uh, start uh, observing essentially how we recover some models that have been already used in the past. So, for example, for certain ranges of the parameters, you actually recover the lamp capacitance models. Um, from this type of analysis, we can also identify for what range of parameters we should not be using reduced order models. Uh, because we cannot guarantee accuracy, and this is represented by the range of parameters that correspond to the white area uh, in, in here. Another, we can identify uh, ranges of parameters where, for example, we know we are going to have a, heat, a, a negative impact on heat dissipation. Now, the question is, this is all good, right? We have, we know that we could use potentially lamp capacitance models that have been around for a long time. Why then do we need all this? Well, so what we did was actually to check um, where uh, the parameters are if we consider real batteries. And so we did a study where essentially we looked at different types of batteries, different types of packing materials, and these are represented by the discrete points. So what you see is that some of the combinations do fall within the lamp capacitance models, but not all of them. And so if we want to retain accuracy, we really need to make sure that whatever battery or combination of battery and packing material we use, um, uh, we do predictions using the correct model. We also I also emphasize that here we have entire classes of combinations that fall into a region where we actually should not be used or cannot be used, um, reduced order models or equivalent representation. So how do, so, so that, le that leads to a number of uh, important consequences. So first of all, uh, one first observation is that even the veracity of continuum scale or reduced order models can be dependent on state of charge, even for the same chemistry. So let's say that we know that the reduced order models performs well for a given chemistry in the given state of charge. That doesn't mean it will work well for that same chemistry at a different state of charge. And we can also perform numerical simulations, but I'm going to go a little faster on this. So what we would love to do is that if you have a battery pack um, specifications and geometry or measure, measured heating rates for given state of charge, we would love to get this information from you so that we can construct our heat generation function build the model that we think would be accurate, would accurately represent your specific condition and then try to you know predict what's going to happen and hopefully compare uh, if you have measurements um, of the temperature distribution in the pack so but what we can do if we cannot use continuum scale models so again it's very important that um, we have a priori control of the error of our models, this is necessary because of model reliability and safety, and it's never advisable to use models that we know we cannot rely on, especially when safety is at risk. However, we can always go to high fidelity simulations, but they are too expensive to simulate the entire system. So our solution is to use hybrid models. So what hybrid models do differently from high fidelity models that are represented here in figure A or equivalent uh, continuum models that are represented in B is that they combine both representations. Um, so what they do is that they resolve the fine scale only when the continuum scale solution is known to be inaccurate. 
And because of that, they still can guarantee predictive accuracy, uh, but they're also computationally cheaper than fine scale simulations because most of the domain is still modeled through uh, equivalent representations. The disadvantage, again, is that the building the coupling, the numerical coupling um, between fine scale and continuum scale equations is not trivial and requires some uh, specialized mathematical expertise. So this is just an example uh, of how a hybrid simulation looks like at the top you see a fine scale simulation where we have 10 cells to the left that undergo thermal runaway and then the heat propagates to the right and triggers the other cells in the middle we have the a classical reduced order uh, model um, simulation and upscale simulations for the packing and cell temperature and at the bottom you you see what a hybrid simulation would look like so you have part of the domain that is resolved by using uh, high fidelity simulations and that is coupled with um, a continuum scale simulation of course the computational cost of these hybrid simulations depend on how big the poor scale domain the fine scale domain is but that kind of analysis can be performed quantitatively and we can really uh, estimate when you start getting significant gains by using hybrid simulations over uh, using full scale full scale high fidelity simulations uh, in this particular sim case study we looked at um, uh, a domain with 80 battery uh, 80 cells and the 800 cells and what you see is that the break-even point becomes more and more advantageous for hybrid simulations and the speed up becomes quite significant so we can get a 15 times speed up um, in a simulation time compared with um, uh, full-scale simulations um, and of course we are also interested in the error we want to ensure that our uh, hybrid simulations are accurate this is again to the left a simulation of the temperature profile as a function of x um, the fine scale solution which is the accurate solution is the dot the upscale solution is this dashed light uh, line over here blue line and the dark ones are the, the hybrid simulation so what you see is that the upscaled or reduced order model simulations really cannot capture the correct temperature at early times but later eventually it can catch up and so what we wanted to do is to essentially ensure that we do not run fine scale simulations unless it is strictly necessary. And for this reason, we also developed adaptive in space and time hybridization strategies with automatic detection. So this is just an example where we use this automatic detection strategy. The top is a fine scale simulation and at the bottom is a hybrid simulation with self detection for an expanding domain. So we start from fewer cells being modeled explicitly, and then this domain expands because and follows essentially the thermal front. We can also do another case, which is contraction. Again, the fine scale simulation is at the top. The hybrid simulation is at the bottom. We start by resolving a lot of uh, cells, but then uh, because um, the thermal gradient decreases, then the domain size of the fine scale simulation decreases too. And so the errors are always good. And this is essentially where we are at. Um, the next steps uh, um, is, is, is to actually go down the scales. Right now we have been focusing on the cell and the battery module and pack scale, but now we want to incorporate physics that go lower uh, to the particle scale. In particular, we're interested in coupling electrochemical transport and heat transfer um, uh, uh, to include all these effects uh, uh, up to the battery pack scale. And we want to develop rigorous reduced order models for online deployment. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude uh, building accurate and predictive reduced order models of thermal runaway in battery packs is important to ensure safe operations under a variety of abuse conditions and to do so at a, a lower cost. Experiments can be very, very costly. Uh, developing such models is time consuming, complex and error prone, yet uh, meeting climate goals does not, does not allow for delay. So new theories and technologies developed in the context of, of formal upscaling, symbolic automated computing, and self-detecting hybrid strategies can really significantly advance our ability to perform computer-aided design to improve safety um, uh, during regular and abuse conditions. And with this, I would like 
thank to thank you all for your attention. I would like again to thank you the group members who provided essentially the content of these presentations and the sponsors. Elenia, thank you so much for this tour de force of the modeling landscape. It was uh, it was amazing to hear and and you organized it so well and uh, um, and gave us a real appreciation of the complexity <laughs> uh, as well as sort of the uh, trade-offs and things to consider. Um, starting at a high level, just out of curiosity, if you were for some of those models, uh, when you, you know, sort of the multi-scale and multi-physics models, how long does it take to build such a model? So that's an excellent question. So there are different components, right? So um, there is the first part, which is actually to derive the equations, right? And that could be incredibly complicated and sometimes not even feasible uh, if you have a lot of different physical processes, a lot of scales. Uh, and up until very recently, this kind of formal derivation was more in the ivory tower. Toy yeah. problems, academic examples. Yeah. Uh, when uh, then we introduced um, symbolic automation, where now we are not limited by complexity anymore. Uh, our claim is that now this rigorous model development can actually be done for complex systems. We are very aware that practitioners in real world do not have, um, you know, the luxury of using complexity as a tuning parameter, like we always do in academia. And so we wanted to fill this gap. And now we feel that with this new technology, we can really do that. Uh, we we can do it really fast. We again we are not limited by the complexity of the system, by the multi-scale nature of the system. Practically, you can give us as many equations that you want. The computer is going to do it for us, and it can do it in like one minute. It would take before years to do that. So that's you know it's been enabled now. Now then there is the numerical part. Once you have the model, then you have to develop the numerical component that represents the model. And again, uh, there has been a push to automate uh, also that component in a way that, uh, because I said, we cannot afford to develop, um, to, to develop these accurate models and take 10 years. Before, that's what would happen, right? For CO2 sequestration, we have these the highly sophisticated codes where multi, hundreds of scientists have worked on, relational labs, universities, but it takes 10 years to develop them. So we believe that symbolic computing can really take a major part in the stage of advancing significantly and speed up these processes uh, so that this very sophisticated models can now be developed like in a year or a couple of years maximum from zero from zero all the way to deployment um so yeah in general it takes a lot we are trying to you know kind of um address that well it's very exciting because now given the urgency and the timing that's necessary to make a significant progress having tools that we can um create these models in real time and allow us to actually predict some of these behaviors um, is incredibly important. Having that toolkit for us is, is you know, it's just incredibly important and we, it's exciting to see this now. Um, so just so that I have a, a clarity on this. So if you were able to develop this full model, could you predict uh, behavior at all the scales within that model? From all the, from the macro scale all the way to the micro scale, and that's the power of such a model. Is that is that accurate? Yes, that is correct. When we get there, because right now for this thermal runaway problem, we are focusing on that specific scale, right? But we intend to kind of actually we're already working on it. In, intend to right. kind of propagate down to the to the to all the to all to the particle level scale. Yes, that's precisely the point. If you once you have the model, you can essentially predict um, uh, the behavior of the system at every uh, level. Uh, now, naturally, validation with experiments will be critical, but I think we are getting there in the sense that now recent publications have shown that we can now actually see the dynamics of charging and discharging at the particle level. And so, you know, we, we, you know, new technologies. And so I think that the experimental uh, imaging um, is, will, will 
and is already kind of there for us to be able to cross validate this model, right? Because there are two parts, like the model, uh, there is the verification part where you create your synthetic system, you presume that the PDEs at the very fine scale are correct, and then you essentially derive everything else. And that is a self-contained process. You can simulate numerically the full scale, the high fidelity, and then make sure that your continuum scale model represents that. But And it's a self-contained conceptual loop, right? But then, of course, you got to add the, the experiments because you may have in the model you start with some inaccuracies, right? And so that's where coming out of that universe is super important and interact with experimentalists because that's when we can verify that the fine scale model we start with is actually accurate because then it's all a cascade of effects that yeah. have to be captured. Yeah. So staying in the weeds uh, a little a little longer, if you have a complex set of uh, fine scale details, like if you were talking about a real battery and have a distribution of particle sizes, distribution of surface morphologies, et cetera, are you able to incorporate that kind of distribution or complexity in such a model? Yes, yes, you can. And we have done it uh, actually for batteries, but not for thermal runaway, for electrochemical transport. Um, uh, I skimmed over that part because it becomes very technical, uh, yeah. but I can give you a flavor of where that information would be. So these models, these equivalent uh, representations, they contain effective parameters. Um, these effective parameters can be calculated by solving a boundary value problem on that REV that I showed you or on the unit cell. Now, the specific information about the to topology and morphology comes in that unit cell because now that unit cell, you can take from XCT scans. Right. You can solve your, your, your boundary value problem on that unit cell and calculate your effective parameters. And we have done it for uh, batteries, but for electrochemical transport. And we, you can then sophisticate the approach and speed up the approach by using even ML and AI, which we have done, but I have not included it in here. Yes, so the answer, yes, absolutely. You can take realistic images and structures of your uh, battery and incorporate that very explicitly in these uh, equivalent representations. Wow, that's very exciting. So in what you're painting is a pathway toward full uh, full modeling once you have it adequately characterized and incorporated in your model and uh, predicting in a range of behaviors. So that's actually my next question. So we talked, uh, you presented quite extensively on, uh, say, thermal runaway, but, you know, other aspects of batteries are are rapidly developing. New chemistries, um, discovering the impact and importance of stress concentrators, all these kinds of things are now being, you know, evaluated and understood and their importance. So if I were to take a leap, then in principle, those kind of properties can also be predicted once you set up your model for the right application. That's correct. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Do you have other examples of where you have uh, done this besides thermal runaway? Yes. So we have done it for electrochemical transport. So um, yeah, calculating, for example, effective conductivity and effective diffusivities of, uh, you know, battery electrodes uh, using this, uh, again, I don't want to become too technical, but using these essentially upscaling theories and using images. Uh, and in that case, wrapping them around uh, kind of machine learning to speed up the process and kind of beat uh, Bruggeman kind of relationships, um, uh, both inaccuracy and breadth of the predictions all over the uh, parameter ranges in terms of porosity, interfacial area, and all that. Uh, we have done it also actually for reactive systems where you also have advection. So, for example, if one application, we have done it in you know as a motivation in the context of you know flow and transport in geologic media for CO two applications. But essentially, the same equations can be applied for flow batteries. And um, so we are able to use topologies of the structure 
of the small structure uh, to essentially calculate effective dispersion uh, of the material, um, uh, effective you know effective dispersion and uh, and uh, effective reaction rates, right? So we can do all that. So we have done it and we have published uh, on this. But yeah, anytime. Um, you have essentially a complex structure, the framework is already there, and it's only the partial differential equations that change. Wow, that's that's really exciting, especially uh, if I assume you would run, if you have the same model and you have a characterization of a new chemistry, yeah, you could move pretty fast. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Predicting absolutely. The behaviors. Yes, yeah. we we only really need images, right? Because essentially we need the image for the pore structure, and then what we need uh, to actually kind of have the model with the parameters is uh, uh, reaction rates. So that like it's a model input. So kind of characterization of the reaction rates at the fine scale, which would come as a boundary conditions in our case. But essentially we just need a structure, uh, effective diffusion in bulk, in the bulk prop, you know, bulk properties, but you know, without crowding effect. Um, and then the reaction rate at the interface. So um, yeah, that kind of characterization. And then it, it's all kind of, I would say for free once you have the framework, not really yeah. until you don't, but. Yeah. And have you applied this to some of the interfacial effects? Because interface, especially with these new battery systems are, are rather complicated and there are many of them. And uh, not just at the fine scale, but also at the next scale and so on. Yeah. Have you so also this is something so again uh, we look at interface i mean you mean grain interface inside yeah grain interface maybe electrodes you know solid electrolyte interface there's you know solid so we, state batteries there's a lot of interfaces yeah. now so at the moment we have only looked at um solid uh, uh liquid electrolyte solid particle interfaces but again um you know, kind of the framework is there. Uh, we have not applied it to other cases, but yes, this is something where, where, you know, including grain interface, it's something that I was always interested in looking at because, again, I think that, again, it's a na it's a very natural process to start looking, you know, at finer, finer, finer scale. So, not done yet, but that's where we would like to move. Oh, absolutely. And uh, we're finding out how much of the behavior is dictated, in fact, by those things that are happening at the interface. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let me just take a, a, a step out a little bit, which is, uh, it was fascinating to describe, to hear about the multi-scale, multi-physics full model. And then you're talking about the hybrid model. If uh, if I were to look and think about it from the standpoint of um, uh, savings, if you will, if you were to to have a hybrid model uh, compared to say a full scale model, um, how much faster or easier is it to build such a model? So again, we are, uh, I mean, you, you mean uh, numerically? Um, for predictive purposes. For predictive purposes, yeah. So, so in our group, we are currently working on automating everything. Hmm. Okay. So because our plan is to kind of have these technologies out of, of the academia and then eventually being deployed, you know, outside. Yeah. But to do that, you need to retain complexity and we can't wait. And so our plan is to automate even the generation of the numerical software. So that it oh. comes out as a package that then can be, you know, kind of, uh, because the point is that is the development. The development takes a lot of time. It requires a lot of very kind of specialized expertise, a particular combination of expertise. And again, um, and it requires also, um, knowledge f knowledge in the specific field right so you need knowledge in physics and chemistry if, if you talk about batteries but then you win would, or electrochemistry but then if you apply the same tool to i don't know um hydrogen storage you would require that specific knowledge right 
so the automation part is aimed precisely at overcoming the hurdles of having to start over from scratch every time for every application. Um, once that framework is in place, again, it's very fast. In the group, we developed the hybrid for batteries in, a, in like less than a year. Okay. But there is a lot of like, of course, historical knowledge, right? right. This is, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years, right? So once you have that knowledge, it's kind of relatively fast to implement it numerically, but we want to shrink that time. And we also want to lower the level of expertise that you need in order to generate your own model for your own specific application. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for keeping the light on. <laughs> I know um, it's weird. Um, it's like if somebody walks by, actually turns on, but if I move a little, it doesn't. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that is becoming very challenging right now, uh, especially as we scale so rapidly, is introducing of new technology and validation or confidence in these new chemistries or other things fast enough uh, before you invest these enormous amounts of money in scaling. And, uh, you know, traditionally the uh, the timeline associated with new battery chemistries and scaling is measured in decades. So it's, you know, it's fascinating now that you could have a tool that could help you leapfrog a lot of that learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before big, huge amounts of money are spent in, in investing uh, new chemistries uh, for batteries or other things. So that's, that's incredibly exciting because I know that many of the people are trying to struggle with that dilemma of when to pull a trigger and have confidence in, you uh, in doing that uh, before they make that large of an investment. Yeah, so. yeah. Again, it's important the model validation. Yeah, so that's uh, it's 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 we we yeah we need to have confidence in the model so that they can you know be reliably used to make those assessments. Absolutely. Yeah, I I, I understand that, and in in many cases, it's not always exactly the same when you're talking about a small scale versus a large scale. But uh, right now, uh, your your modeling uh, gives a gives a pathway to getting greater confidence, yeah. uh, assuming that you have the same kind of characteristics of your batteries if you scale up, and those can actually be validated yeah, separately. Absolutely. absolutely. So that's uh, I think that's what makes it so exciting is that you have a way to be comprehensively predicting a lot of the battery performance uh, aspects. Yeah. And also, like, I think, you know, if you do like this skill translation accurately, you can also identify um, emergent dynamics. So dynamics that, again, you might not see at the fine scale, but then it emerges as a result of coupling processes over longer scales or, or larger scales. So um, you don't even have to presume how the system is going to behave at a larger scale. It just emerges naturally if you know, the calculations are performed accurately. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Elenia. And you. Uh, at this point, I would like to go ahead and bring back Troy to the discussion. Hi, Troy. Hi. Right. Enjoyed the uh, Elenia's talk there. I enjoyed yours too. Thank you, Troy. <laughs> and actually, I just realized we're both Tritons. I didn't, I hadn't made that connection. We both went oh, to me neither. Yeah. Oh, I was a few fantastic. years before you, though. You're both what? Triton. You what both went, built their PhD at UC San Diego. Ah, and that's a Triton? Yeah, you know, it's not a Division One school, so you don't see it like it. You know. <laughs> but yeah, they're the Tritons. Oh, right. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Um, so, you know, one of the things um, that we see right now, and we're, uh, we're, that's a concern as we scale up, really, uh, is around this mountain of batteries and you know what do we do with it and how much residual value is there in those batteries and their second use you know etc and so one of the questions I have which is a little bit um, a little bit of a, a segue but really is long can you use types of these types of models uh, to predict things like or maybe a um, residual life and can you do that in a way where there's a, a small amount of work to tell you how much residual life there is and potentially incorporate that as part of uh, a value statement for second life batteries or second use batteries or et cetera. Uh, that's one of the big opportunities that I see coming over the horizon. Uh, and I'm, I'm opening that, you know, from both 
and any of your mommy, but also Troy, kind of understanding what kind of characterization uh, might be necessary to validate that. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, the approach and strategy for recycling versus second use. Obviously, the most direct, if you can just take a, a battery that needed a, a low impedance and high, high discharge capability from an EV and plug that into a low discharge uh, energy storage facility, that's great, right? Uh, challenges, obviously, are when people are using different form factors, that doesn't work. So you need to have you know, modules from, you know, if you have someone huge like a Tesla, you can design a system around their, their battery modules. But, um, you know, there have been... Uh, forward-thinking individuals that said, "Well, we can we can use batteries of all types and mix and match them all together." Uh, yeah. That would be a nightmare if there were failures. Like, how do you know even you know which type of cell to start with? It would be, be a nightmare. But but yeah, it is interest an interesting challenge to um, you know is it the, is it the impedance that's most important? Um, you know, they're each battery because it behaves different based on its design and chemistry. Um, is going to be a little different. So there's not going to be a one solution for all of them. But but certainly impedance uh, of the cell is, is one critical uh, thing you can look at, um, your charge efficiency and it to kind of monitor state of health. Um, but but yeah, I don't know. Eleni, have you done much on modeling of U cells? Or you kind of think of what, what things are new and that's where you're starting everything? Yeah. No, no, we have not, right? It's... Um... Uh, that's why I put a slide, I want you, <laughs> 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 because, uh, again, all this that we have done, uh, it's essentially, uh, you know, all kind of theoretical, and, that, and some of it actually was done based on, uh, you know, published, you know, data, uh, but that's why I think the collaboration with experimentalists is so critical, because I think that we could actually help answer the question. Um, I think that there is um, an additional component into, you know, the complexity of this is that in order to be able to predict, you know, kind of battery life numerically, you have to run a simulation that simulates battery lives, right? So it goes back to that comp to, to that. Um, uh, separation of temporal skills, where now we should be able to build models that actually can be run efficiently to simulate years of operation, right? But again, I think the framework is there, but in this frame, and we can certainly go off a tangent and do it, but I think the integration with experimentalists and understanding like where they are coming from, what is it that they can or cannot measure, right? Because uh, one thing that I found in the past working with experimentalists in other fields is that with modeling, I mean, we have it easy to some extent. You know, we have our, you know, uh, whatever, uh, virtual environment, and uh, we assume we know what we want to know, and uh, we then do predictions and make statements. But oftentimes we forget that not everything that we want to know it can actually be measured and so you know there has to be a con and that is Im very important for model validation which i think is again super critical to build reliability in the model so that when a model is deployed to provide advice or guidance can be relied upon and so um so i think yes it's possible uh, you know, there certainly will be ter technical hurdles on how to um, simulate thousands of cycles fast without having to spend years in simulating time or, yeah. you know, whatever months, but it can yeah. be done. But it's important to then iterate ba back with the experimentalists to see, like, what is it that they can test so that we can build confidence in these models before starting making assessments or, you know, provide guidance. Yeah, one, yeah, one so... thing, another thing on that, Jimmy, you, you talked about what different things can cause their runaway. Well, you imagine we're talking about handling new cells and new battery modules, and the assembly can cause uh, some headaches and cause some issues. Now imagine you've got a cell that's gone through, you know, 10 years of swelling, it's got more stress in it. If you have to do a second use at a cell level, now you're going to be taking out cells that don't have the same rigid rigidity, they have different degradation. Um, and right. so whether you're doing a module or, or whatever level, you got to consider those things. Uh, my, you know, my PhD was on the failure of propensity of spent nuclear fuel, things that you were trying to handle nuclear fuel rods after being in dry in, in wet pools for, for many years and then dry storage before going into you know, a permanent repository. 
they're degraded to no end. And, and this huge challenge trying to work, you know, work with the, the alloys that have had irradiation and creep. And, and so the same thing with batteries, just like now you've got a whole new system, whether you're modeling it or designing your, your structures to deal with uh, degraded and, and you know, behaviors that we don't really know because we're still in the front end of this process. For us, it's yeah. just an initial condition. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's very exciting now because many of these uh, applications now are actually uh, are actually profiling the battery use over the course of their lifetime. So now they have all this data, and uh, and they're potentially now in, in principle have giving you a path to start looking and metal, you know understanding the impact of these various things. And if you are able to simulate it over lifetime, like you're describing, and know the uh, use profile discharge, et cetera, uh, charge. And, you know, it would be amazing to be able to uh, have a model that could actually predict, okay, under these kind of conditions, we expect, you know, this to be a residual life value of this or, or remaining lifetime of this or this type of application, sort of a, a report card, if you will, that would yeah. come with it. And it could be at the pack level, but, you know, certainly I could see uh, that being tremendously uh, uh, useful. Yeah, and we do this for other applications, right? So, for example, for CO2 sequestration, I mean, you look at, uh, you know, centuries of, of, you know, in the future, you want to make sure that it doesn't leak out, right? So, the technologies are there to actually do that. And I think that we just have to take advantage and uh, of, you know, our know-how from other fields uh, and then essentially apply to you know this 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 specific uh, domain knowledge. And it's also one of the things we battle, to be honest, is it's not a big academic setting where we're just doing research on batteries. There's also the commercial competition. And so a lot of these data that you're talking about are there. And certain manufacturers, whether the OEMs like the the you know GM and Ford and uh, Chrysler, these kind, they have data. Then you have the LG and Panasonic. They have data. They they know their own things. They aren't rather necessarily willing to share what is that key piece that I've learned from my research with everyone else. Because if their battery can behave safe more safely or or longer life, that gives them a competitive advantage. And it's really interesting to watch when you go to the conferences and discussions. You you kind of move that direction. People are very secretive, and that's kind of our IP. And then when you have these penultimate events like the the Sony recall back in the the you know the late 2000s, and I think recently on some like the the big GM uh, LG recalls, then it's more of a community that people feel, hey, we're being attacked for the integrity of our batteries as a whole because the top tier manufacturers are failing, and so now we're losing the public you know uh, confidence, and so this whole technology may not succeed if we don't work together. So then you kind of shift back to sharing and kind of doing the right thing. But then you kind of forget about those events and pretty soon it's it's kind of this competition of IP. So it's kind of interesting to watch those cycles. Yeah, I, yes, a absolutely. And certainly data right now is one of the things that people hold very close to their uh, to their vest. And, uh, I, you know, we certainly see that also. Um, but I think that's where university actually can play a role of just disclosing everything that we yeah. know because for the you know for putting the knowledge out there uh, so that it can be used uh, you know to improve uh, society um so yeah i think uh, yeah can work yeah absolutely <laughs> and I, I certainly think here uh, you know as part of uh, the new stanford door school of sustainability that is part of our mission really and so it's very exciting to see that um a topic around you know um climate, uh, meaning regional climate differences. So if you do some sort of characterization of battery performance and you do it under a certain set of conditions, but then the climate varies dramatically. Uh, like the climate in India is going to be very different from the climate in Palo Alto. Okay, the climate in, uh, in Saudi Arabia or any other regions, uh, or if you go way up north. And so my question is uh, along the ability of uh, these models to predict those kind of climate effects on the performance or properties of the battery. Do you feel like at this point that you could actually, you know, plug in and say, well, if I had this type of humidity, humidity level or this kind of temperature variation over the course of a day or 
you know, a, a year yeah, or something. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, we are not there yet, but theoretically, yes, because these are boundary conditions for us. So once the infrastructure is all there, again, we have it easy to some extent. Like once we build the complete infrastructure, then of course you could start accounting for all these kind of effects. And for us, those are essentially boundary conditions. So we just impose those and, uh, um, and run the forward model. Um, yeah. But we are not there yet. So it's, uh, you know, we have boundary conditions clearly, but we cannot account for humidity, right? It's uh, I, our boundary condition is just to external temperature and that, but that's already, that already can be included. Yeah. And, and these outliers, Jim, uh, Jimmy, it's, it's, it is really important. Um, if, if for those that have owned EVs, they, they frequently um, can turn themselves on and use their own air conditioning and things like that to keep the, the battery at a certain temperature range. What happens if you drive into the Phoenix airport and you're down to 10% state of charge and you go on a business trip for a month? Um, you know, is, is there enough re remaining capacity to actually continue to, to keep that in the condition you need or is it gonna see these spikes? And if they have these spikes, how are you, how are you dealing with it um, you know, on, on the management of the battery moving forward? Yeah, we, we've, we receive these kind of requests a lot, which is, you know, um, we understand and uh, read about the battery performance in say uh, Palo Alto. Okay, you know, but we're we don't have the same climate as a Mediterranean climate in Palo Alto. Right? We have this and that and stuff, you know. And we're interested in knowing how how it would actually perform in this in this uh, climate and stuff. And uh, um, and a lot of times, I know a lot of people are running a mountain of experiments, characterizing them under different use conditions in different climate. So I would imagine if there was such a model which they could mm -hmm. um, could predict, it would be tremendously valuable. As this spreads around the whole uh, around the whole uh, planet, and so I have the a question. Is changing, so that becomes <laughs> even more relevant. <laughs> right, that's another thing, right? It's dynamic now, right? And so exactly. it should be a much more complicated <laughs> Who knows what's landscape. What's going to happen in ten years? <laughs> so I have a question from the audience. Um, so let me just read it. Um, could these models be leveraged to determine gas compositions expected during thermal runaway? Knowing gases that are that are present is critical for fire safety design, and the only way to get that data now is to literally to do thermal runaway and measure. Mm -hmm. So, so we don't have the capability yet, but that's why I included that comment on uh, uh, framework flexibility and generally and uh, generalizability. Sorry, I didn't get that right, but anyway. Uh, so the idea is that as we have the infrastructure, this, this framework, then we can start adding physics. Uh, so at the moment, we have demonstrated the capability of the framework, you know, essentially on a basic benchmark, which is, you know, conduction and the heat generation and heat sinks associated with, for example, cooling pipes. But then ultimately, the idea is to add layers of physics um, that can then be modeled uh, to include additional effects. We don't have this capability yet, but the idea is to increase the complexity to get all the physics that we need uh, so that they can hopefully you know, match the experiments that uh, Troy is running. Yeah, and one thing that's really helpful there is, of course, you can measure the gas volume and, and composition, um, but also NASA designed a fractional calorimeter, which we, we use also, which allows you to differentiate between the positive material ejecta, negative material ejecta, the gas, um, and what's remaining in the can. So you're able to kind of really drill down and get data for those models. Um, and that's, that's going to help as, as they get developed moving forward. Well, that's that's amazing. So you could, when you say physics, then do you also refer to chemistry? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's, yeah. I think, the, you know, our uh, our current work, actually, Zishin, um, the student, is working exactly on coupling the electrochemistry with the thermal effects, because the idea is that this heat generation curve is actually driven by the chemistry. And so the idea is that then by including, you know, the electrochemistry part, uh, then you know, that becomes all fully coupled and integrated because clearly the temperature rise, you know, it's what leads to this more exothermic reaction that then gets sp sped up and then produce a further uh, um, temperature rise, right? And so that coupling, I think, is the one that we want to capture first. Uh, there are so many things that we need to do, but I think that 
this is the one where we are investing now most of our effort, coupling the electrochemist electrochemical transport with uh, thermal. Amazing. So uh, thank you on behalf of our community here in Storage X and people around the world that are listening to us. Thank you very much for your contributions and efforts in this space. It's great to, and for participating in our Storage X symposium, it's great to see the progress and the learning and the sharing as you, as you both are doing uh, for our community. So we have our upcoming events uh, we have a, next week, we have our second international symposia for the summer, Chris Graves and Colin Wessels. Uh, these are two startups that are now within this ecosystem. Uh, so come and hear about that. And we also have our Storage X talk uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, uh, by John Hollowback here at Stanford. So Please join us for those two events, and we look forward to uh, continue the engagement and uh, um, so again, Elenia and Troy, thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank All you. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Much.